And the church teaches that this is in fact the primary purpose of matrimony. The next blessing that St. Augustine mentions is that of fidelity of the spouses to each other. He says that this fidelity will be made easier and stronger if the two spouses love each other and that their love for each other should affect all aspects of their family life. But he specifies that the love they have to have for each other is not simply, again, a physical attraction that very quickly disappears, nor is it based on pleasing words only, as our corrupt society tends to think, but rather it should be something truly in the heart in such a way that it is shown by actions. It is very easy to tell someone that you love them, but you have to show it in your actions in order for your words to be true. That's the point of Pius XI. He says that every day in the home, the husband and the wife have opportunities to show their love for each other by helping each other in the duties of, of their family. And especially, in fact, most of all, in helping each other advance in virtue. And he says that they can achieve even a high level of sanctity from the fulfillment of their duties of family life and this help they give to each other. In fact, many people have become saints by living a holy family life. The Pope then talks about the hierarchy in the family. He says that the husband is the head of the wife and the children. He says the wife should obey the husband promptly and with subjection, as St. Paul says. But he says that the obedience of the wife does not deny the dignity that belongs to her as wife and mother. She is not on the level of a, a small child who has to obey every single thing that his parents tell him. But on the other hand, the Pope also condemned the exaggerated liberty of the wife that is taught today. He says that frees her from any responsibility to the family. He quotes his predecessor, Leo XIII, also, who explained this by saying that the man is, is the ruler and the head of the, the family and of the woman, but since she is flesh of his flesh, and bone of his bone. He says, let her be subject and obedient to the husband, not like a maid servant, but rather like a companion. And in this way, her obedience is something dignified and honorable at the same time. And he says that the husband who is in charge has a duty to observe charity in the leadership that he has over the family. So they both have responsibilities here. Pope Pius XI also condemns the modern idea of the married woman who has a full-time job and who neglects her husband and children in order to pursue a career. He says this is not at all a true emancipation of women as it is presented by the modern world. He says this is something that is not worthy for a wife and mother to do, nor is it in accord with reason, but really it is a corruption of her dignity as a woman to deprive her husband of a wife and deprive her children of her care in the home. He says that women who leave their families to enter the workforce are actually coming down from a throne that the gospel has given them inside the home. And they will be in a degrading manner, they will be treated in a degrading manner by, by the men that they work for in the workplace. And he says that in fact, they will revert to the way that women were treated in pagan times as the mere instrument of man. That is what he predicted, and in fact, this, this prediction has come true exactly. And how often we hear today about women who go into the workforce, they find that they are treated actually in a degrading manner by the men that they work for. 
It's exactly what Pius XI said was going to happen. He says it is only in the home that the wife and mother is given the honor she truly deserves. The third fruit of matrimony listed by St. Augustine is the fact that it is a sacrament and a source of grace. This indicates the indissolubility of this union also. Our Lord was very clear that any form of divorce was now permitted in the New Testament and that anyone who attempted to marry a divorced person would be committing the sin of adultery. And Pius XI says that the reason marriage is indissoluble is because the sacrament of matrimony is a symbol of the union between Christ and his church. And of course, Christ will be united to his church, his, his bride, until the end of time. In the same way, husband and wife are joined to each other until death. But he says that this is a great sacrament, and there are great graces attached to this union. So, this indissoluble union should not be looked upon as a burden, but rather as a source of peace and of grace. He says that the effects of this sacrament are to perfect and advance and strengthen the natural love that the husband and wife have for each other. He says, when the faithful receive this sacrament, they open up an immense treasury of grace for themselves from where they can draw enormous supernatural strength to fulfill the obligations of their state in a holy and noble manner and persevere until death. Like all sacraments, of course, matrimony, of course, increases sanctifying grace. But he says that it also bestows special gifts on those who receive it, its own sacramental power. It gives the husband and wife good dispositions of mind to help them be a good husband and a good wife. And he says that these are like seeds of grace. It is like an ever-flowing fountain of actual graces that is opened up in the souls of the husband and wife on their wedding day. And these actual graces increase their natural powers to be good spouses and parents. They strengthen their ability to be kind and patient and self-sacrificing and everything else they need. And as I said, this source of strength and grace that they will, they receive will last for their entire life. Now, someone might say, my marriage has been very difficult. I don't think I have experienced what the Pope is describing here. And Pius XI answers this objection. He says that people do not receive the graces if they place an obstacle to receiving them. Or they may be receiving these graces but not cooperating with them. He says the spouses have to use the supernatural strength to cultivate the graces they receive. They have to observe the laws of God. They have to receive the sacraments. They have to practice their faith. They have to put in their own efforts to be good parents and spouses. They have to make a constant effort to fulfill the duties uh, they have on their own part. And if they don't do this, and cooperate with this source of grace they are given, then he says it will remain like a treasure that is buried in a field. It is there, but it is not being used. But he quotes St. Augustine again, who encourages married people by saying that people who have once been joined in matrimony can never be deprived of these sacramental graces just as they can never be deprived of the bond of matrimony until one of them dies. And so, therefore, it is never too late for them to begin using these sacramental graces. After the, discussing these wonderful effects of the sacrament of matrimony, Pope Pius XI discusses and condemns some of the serious sins against marriage. 
He discusses, first of all, spouses who want to avoid what they call the burden of having children and who use evil means to that end. He says there is nothing that can justify this terrible sin. His words are that the divine majesty looks upon this nefarious crime with the greatest hatred and has even punished it with death, as we read in the book of Genesis. And he condemns a group of Protestants, Anglicans, who had just come out and said that it was not a sin for parents to avoid having children, even using artificial means. The sin is almost universally practiced and accepted today, but it is a historical fact that for almost 2,000 years, no heretic had ever denied that this is a grievous sin, until for the first time in history, the Anglican Church in 1930 said that there were cases in which the prevention of having children would not be a sin. And this caused an immense shock and scandal throughout the world. And it was partly in response to this, this statement they made that Pope Pius XI wrote this encyclical. He uses his supreme authority as Pope and he proclaims that this sin infringes on the law of God and of nature. And those who have committed any such act are stained with the guilt of grievous sin. After this, he condemns a very similar sin, which has also become rampant today, the sin of abortion, which was starting to become widespread in the world in the 1920s, along with the the collapse of the rest of morality, as I said. And his words here are considered mostly a condemnation of the communist Soviet Union, which was only a few years old at this point, but it had already legalized abortion as early as 1920 under Lenin. But Pope Pius XI says that those who hold high office among nations and pass laws must not forget that it belongs to public authority to defend the lives of the innocent. And he says that an unborn child is the most innocent and defenseless person in society and that the rulers of society have correspondingly the greatest obligation to protect them from murderous attack. And the Pope concludes by leveling a terrible warning against such rulers. He says, if public magistrates not only do not protect those little ones, but even pass laws and ordinances to allow this crime. Let them remember that God is the judge and avenger of innocent blood that cries out from heaven, from earth to heaven. What powerful and simple words he uses to attack an evil that is defended with such sophistry and lies to this day. It is always instructive to read the words of the popes, meaning the true popes, obviously. Their teachings to the church are always spoken with words that are so holy and spiritual, and yet with a very clear vision of what they are teaching. We can't find any better source or authority on the questions of today. So I encourage all married people today to reject the evil worldly ideas about family life that we are constantly being poisoned with from the world, and instead to learn what the church has taught on this important subject, and as always, to imitate the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.